I'm back. Well, what have we got today? Well, it's an old friend, Eventide. I go back quite a long way with Eventide, strangely enough, and uh, yeah, they seem to have been there forever. They're probably one of the best effects uh, type of uh, manufacturers in the world. Well, hey, here we are. The Eventide H90. The darn thing that uh, took me forever to get hold of. Yeah. Well, it wasn't forever to get hold of as such. It was just forever to get hold of from the carrier. DPD. Uh, uh, what a bunch of cowboys. I ended up having to go and collect it myself. But enough about them. This is all about the H90 harmonizer from Eventide, and what we're going to do is we're going to unbox it, take a close look at the unit itself. We're going to go inside and delve around and have a look at all them components that nobody ever shows you, which are really important on this device. And then we're going to come back up top, have a good look at it. We're going to get the editor out and take a look at the editor. And then we're going to do some demos with the H90 harmonizer, both with and without backing tracks. Yeah, so you can get that sort of real uh, tone coming out of this thing. And I'm looking forward to it, actually, because uh, this is the first H9 series. The H9s didn't have it. The H90 has a Univibe or something very similar. So let's zoom along and uh, put it down there and uh, get this thing out of the box and see what it comes with. Well, hey, this is exactly as she comes. Yeah. Pretty standard looking box, really, I guess. Let's have a look inside. I mean, I haven't opened this either yet. I'm looking forward to doing this. Well, you got the usual uh, sort of quick reference guide. Oh, it looks quite nice. Oh, a couple of stickers and a pick. What more could you ask for? It looks like there's some feet there, too. Look that over there. Oh, yes, here it is. It's one of those... Uh, it's one of those uh, things you stick on the wall, a wall wart. I'm not really keen on them. And I would have thought that for the thousand pounds that this unit is, even time might have come up with something better than that. But there you go. And lastly, you've got the device itself. It comes all nice and, and well wrapped. Let's move that out of the way. Let's see what we've done here. And here it is out of the box. It's a very presentable product, this. I mean, I have to tell you that I've had three H9s over the years. I had the base one and then two Max ones. Um, more about that later. But this one seems to me to be a much improved version. Maybe this is the one they should have made when they made the H9. Yeah, yeah. It's no more about the H9 for now. But as you can see, it's it well enough laid out. We're com coming back to all of this. We've got MIDI in and out, which is a standard connections, which I love that really, don't you? Loads of iron on the back, line levels in and out. Uh, we've got a USB-C to say the very least, and uh, we'll come back to all of that. What we've got around the back, just an even side sticker that says FCC, CE, and Rush Compliance. Designed in New Jersey and assembled in China. But that's what you would expect, isn't it? You know, they won't be uh, assembling many at the moment, I don't think, with all that uh, bug kicking around. So there's a quick shot of the uh, H90 and how you'd expect to see it uh, sort of looking from above. Yeah, it's not a small device. And, uh, you know, if you wanted it on your pedal board, uh, you might think twice about that. Maybe that's why the H9 was uh, smaller. But you know, for all this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the lid off and get inside this thing and have a really, uh, first of all, a quick look and then a bit, a bit more in-depth chat about some of the chips, if I can find the information. Well, here's a quick uh, overview of the internals of the H90 harmonizer from Eventide. And you can see right off, 
It comprises of two components, the top half which is really all the controls, which we're not going to spend too long on because there's not really that much to see. But the main board here is the one we ought to really be focusing on because, well, this is what it's all about, this board here. This is where all the, uh, the magic happens, or the fun happens, or the horrible noises happen, depending on your point of view. It's all relative, but uh, my own experience, I think Eventide uh, is probably one of the best uh, effects manufacturers in the world, even today. But before we do go much further, I just want to show you something I just noticed. Now, it could be me, or it may not be me, but I'm just going to zoom into this thing. And right there, that was sort of hanging off. That might not have been uh, from Eventide. I might have knocked it while I was pulling it out and so on and so forth. But it doesn't look the sort of thing you're just going to really just knock out, does it? But that's another thought. We'll talk about that later. And here's a... Uh, the first look at the main primary board within the Eventide H90. You can see, without even going anywhere, that the quality on this thing generally is nigh on perfect. It would be. I've got an, uh, an Eventide in the other room in the studio, and I can tell you that the overall quality of that device is superb inside in fact i did show how to change the battery on it and i'll put a little link down in the text so you can go and have a look inside a h uh, 7600 uh, rack processor from eventide which at the time cost oh, thousands of pounds I make no mistake about that this one on the other hand is a lot smaller but it's still not a cheap device and we'll be coming back to the pricing a bit later i mean what do you get for your money We'll see. What I want to do though is to zoom in a little bit closer if I can. So we can get a bit of a better overview rather than just at a distance. Now to be honest, I don't know how well you'll see any of this on the video. I, I'm looking at it now and it, it does look okay. But uh, like everything else, uh, I really want to get a few chip numbers and things like that. So at least you've got some idea of what's going on inside this unit. Well, look at this one first. Uh, yeah, that looks an important chip. <laughs> well, actually, this one here. There it is. This is what they call a, an ARM chip. So it's a processor type of thing. It's a, it's a Giga device, and it's a GD32F103. More about that a bit later when we come back and take a look. Let's have a look at this other one. Well, that looks like... A, a chip that's a, a PCM3168. And again, we'll come back and take another look at that. And there are also, of course, little chips like this one kicking around on the PCB. This one basically is a, a 21114ES, whatever that is. I'll try and find it. As you can see around this board, generally speaking, it's pretty good quality. I can show you the uh, capacitors that are in there. You can see them. I don't know the brand, but you might. We've got a big fat one further down here, which I can show you an image of now. But also, do remember that all these I.O. connectors are just plastic connectors moulded onto the board. And I, I always remember a guy not too long ago talking about these uh, connectors being plastic and uh, you know how fragile they can be well they do look okay but he had a point there's no doubt about that this is a quick shot of the uh, really what the, is the top board or control board in my opinion I don't really see much going on in there except uh, something to drive the screen and lots of control knobs and things like that what you can see that overall that the, the soldering is nigh on perfect and that's always an important point as was on the other board that's just down there off camera it was all nigh on perfect it was a little concerning that this one was hanging out and I, I really don't think I knocked that one out I really don't uh, these take some getting out and I, I think this one had just flirted out somehow maybe in transit or something but it's worth knowing because uh, if you've got one of your buttons that doesn't work 
well, <laughs> yours might have flipped out too. The only other thing I can show you on this that might be interesting to somebody is that there. Lamb. Lamb UI, it says. A lamb UI. Well, very interesting that is. And uh, I think I've seen that sort of uh, comment on the other board as well. Yeah, I wonder if they actually farmed out the uh, development to a, a sub-company. Because sometimes companies do that. They will say, make this from this. Here's the plan. Get on with it. And then they'll have them made in China subsequently. Which this one says it's made in China. So, who knows about that? I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, why I'm a user interface, it might be a... A sort of prototype name for it or something. It could be anything. But it's just interesting to know that this is uh, the little lamb. I think Mary had got one too. <laughs> so that's it for the insides. I'm going to box it up now and uh, we'll have a little chat about the chips a bit later on. Let's uh, box it up and go from there. Well, there it is back together. Yeah. Oh, you mean you didn't think I could do that? Of course I can. Anyway, there it is back together. And, uh, yeah, we'll take a look at the top controls and the back I.O. and the side I.O. And then we'll move on. Uh, interestingly, just before we get to any of this at the top, because we usually cover the back first. These are not click types. These are just push types that don't actually click. So how good that little switch was inside... Who knows? Who knows the answer to that? Doesn't really matter, but I did point it out when I did find it. And of course, the very first thing you've got as we start turning around the unit is MIDI, which is great because this unit probably uh, will respond very well to MIDI and it will respond definitely better with these full-size MIDI connectors that I really like to see. None of this cheap and nasty Horrible stuff that you see on some of the Roland stuff, for example, where you've got uh, a 3.5 mil jack, stereo jack, acting as some MIDI cable for some reason. Yeah, you want the full-size stuff. These people can do it. I don't know why anybody else can't. Okay, well, uh, it's time to have a look across the back here and what we've got and what we haven't got. And uh, there's certainly a lot to look at, I can tell you that. Well, let's start off at the far end. We've got these two things here, this ins and outs. And basically, these are LED uh, grids indicating which inputs or outputs are set for line level signals. That's definitely worth having on the end of there, because uh, what you don't want is you don't want to be uh, overdriving the stuff. Now, if we look at this one here, this one and two, you can see these two here. Well, those are main mono or stereo inputs. That, there they are. And if we look at the next two along, these two, which are noted as three and four, can you see that? Uh, and this, their inputs three and four, and these are external input returns, basically, or they can be used for inputs for dual path two. Yeah, more, more about that later. Moving along a bit further, we've got the output section, and this is one and two of the outputs, which again is main mono or stereo output. Pretty obvious. But again, you've got this three and four and of the outputs. And the three and four of the outputs, again, is an external insert send. Or it can be used as an output for the dual path two. Again, more on that later. Moving along a bit further, we've got the usual uh, one and two things here. The expression or control pedal. Uh, and you can uh, basically... Uh, yeah, use org switches, basically, or expression pedals for changing the, uh, the, maybe the effect, or the reverb, or the this, or the that, or the anything you want, really. I love to see, again, a USB-C. A lot of people move into USB-C now, rather than the old uh, style USB. You'll know which ones, I mean, the micros and all them. Uh, they were, well, they're a bit... Long in the tooth these days, but all the modern stuff seems to have this. But some of the Roland stuff still got some of the old ones on. I don't know. I, I don't quite get that. Uh, this doesn't take up any more space than what the old micro one does. But the old micro one seems to have been fitted. 
And further along here, we, I like to see this. We've got the uh, the actual power requirements, all the rest of it. Basically, it's a 9 to 12 volt DC. It's 12 volt uh, and, uh, consumption. And it's a center positive. It's 5.5 mil be 2.5 mil jack, which a lot of people don't actually tell you. So you go groveling around, messing around, trying to, uh, <laughs> to find the right size. And that's it for along the back. And uh, I think we'll move across to the top now. Yeah, that's more interesting, of course. But if you haven't got the I.O. on the back, well, you're not going to be doing this, that or the other. Or all the things you might want to do, but can't, even though it's got these ultra sounds inside it. This is what you get when you turn her on. Of course, the thing is, I don't see any flashing where even tide came up, by the way, and the, the screen's perfect for me, but when it comes on camera, it's not always perfect, is it? There it is, firing up now. It's just finishing up, it says there. All very nice, all good, but... Yeah, there it is, ready to go. All great, isn't it? Well, it's not really all great and let me explain why there's the power coming in at the top and i ran it off round the side down here you can see it just about down there going down to a, a mains plug underneath the table and the cable is hardly long enough it's not really a very long cable off that mains adapter and the second problem i had with that mains adapter is it comes with various types of uh, converters for different countries the scary thing for me is the power adapter is really cheap and really nasty in my opinion when i try and pull it back out of the socket this little thing or one of them flirts off and uh, remains stuck into the socket with the mains turned on and you can see well you can't be electrocuted by it or any of these it's a real poor show, that is. Uh, what you really want is a Roland adapter. If that will work, I'd need to check, of course. And so will you. But my opinion on the power supply is it's rubbish. Sadly, as you can see on the screen right now, the standard Roland adapter doesn't work. It's the wrong way around. I suppose you can get converters and things like that. And it's only 9 volts. It says it will work from 9 volts, but... These geniuses in their, uh, in their wisdom have sent a positive instead of sent a negative, which is what Rowan generally is. Okay, so I'm not going to spend all day messing around with this. I'm just going to run through it quickly, reasonably quickly, because we've got all the software to look at, and the software I always think is better than messing around with this sort of thing on here. Unless you've got no other choice and uh, there's no software. Well, you've got no other choice out here. <laughs> let's, uh, let's run through it. This is a select knob. It says on. That's not difficult. You press this to enter select and bank mode. Uh, that's what that one does. You've got a little Bluetooth light there that isn't really on at the moment, but it will be at some stage. We've got input meters. You can see them. We've got a performance knob. And again, very cleverly, it says perform on it. And you press to enter the performance mode. So you've got... Bank mode and performance mode. That's not really difficult, is it? Moving down back to this side, if you look at these two down here, these are like edit mode buttons, and uh, you press to enter edit modes. There's a table that you can look at, and uh, yeah, you can take a look at them. Uh, in the edit modes, you've got programs, presets, routing, and parameters, so it's all good. And you've got a very similar thing over here for the uh, for the play modes, funnily enough. <laughs> and, and I'll put that on the screen as well. So it just uh, clears things up so I don't have to run through everything 20 times. They have a thing called the anatomy of a program, which sort of shows you, uh, gives you a bit of a clue about where this can be uh, routed to, preset A, preset B, program this, da 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 da. As I said, I can spend all day going around this. I'm not going to do it like I normally do. Uh, I could spend an hour going pressing buttons. We don't want to do that. We want to move on to the software, really. Well, across the middle, you've got these three here. Now, these are uh, relating to these up here. You can see them. 
And those are basically what they call quick knobs for adjusting parameters and settings. So if I was to twizzle one, you can see I can adjust the settings for different ones. And if you leave them long enough, they go away just like that. So I could change the delay mix. It's all simple. You don't touch anything. It goes back to as it, as it was. It's position. Yeah. All good. We've got three LEDs across here. These are what they call the, uh, the active LED buttons. Basically, you've got play modes and edit modes, which we've already talked about. When it's in play modes, the colour indicates the foot switch function. When in uh, edit modes, uh, the program and presets determine the active or bypass status. When we've got the select node, we can turn this, we scroll through the playlist. You can see them all here. Put it back as it was. If I, if I want to load one, I just press it, basically. Very simple. That was it. All very simple. Exactly what you'd expect it to be, really. But you can toggle the mount mode by holding it. And now we're in bank mode. And we can flip back. Nice and simple. But there is a lot to go on, you know, with these controls. And I found this on the H9 that Although this is substantially better, the H9, you were faffing around with that little wheel and messing around, something shocking. I couldn't really get on with it. I tried three times, so I bought three of them off and on. I mean, you simply press this to turn that off or to turn it on, right? That simple. And as for these two, uh, you can see you've got an up and a down arrow. We can sort of scroll through the presets if that's what you want to do. Now when you've flipped into this uh, bank mode, you've still got to select the various parameters with this one. But with this one, you can uh, change that volume there and things like that. Now when you're in this mode, everything changes. You need to get that in your head. It's almost like two pedals. Well, I guess is it really is two pedals. You know, the thing about all these banks and all this sort of stuff is it can be a little bit daunting. Depending on whether you've got pressure on you when you're at a gig, for example, uh, and, and, you know, oh my God, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> I would strongly suggest you set up your own uh, tones and presets and just use them. Don't mess about spending hours with all this stuff. Some people will. Uh, personally, I don't think I would. I think it's a bit, you know, the interface is good. It's better than the H9, but it's not perfect. No matter what anybody says, it's all much of a muchness. And I think one of the main things for me is that the software really allows you to get into this unit and uh, do it in the easier way really, than faffing around uh, pressing buttons all day, which, you know, you might have a bit of trouble with that. So I, I could go on now uh, and talk about insert routine and dual routine and what else they got in this little 15-page manual. Presets, parameters, you name it, it's all there. And I could very easily spend an hour faffing around talking about pressing a few knobs. I'm not going to do that, in fact. I don't really want the video to be 10 hours long, which it could easily be with an even tide. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to say enough's enough of these buttons now. Y you get the flavour of it. That's all that matters. Now the H90 control provides remote control access and program list management for the H90. And by God, it, it's always uh, welcome, that is, to be able to work in a different way than pressing buttons and, oh my God, where's the manual gone? <laughs> I always kept going back to the H9. Oh my God, now what do I press? What do I do? What's this? What? If you think you're different, well, you might be, but a lot of guys aren't, and that's the truth of it. And I, I come from technology, by the way. I don't actually come from being a bricklayer or something. Uh, but I couldn't store all that information, and I, I've got pages more of it in my head. 
for it's a gig and no, I haven't got the manual and all the rest of it. You can manage the program and preset settings with the H90 control. You can perform system updates, import and export user lists, and it's an easy to use interface and basically you, you just download it uh, and it gets downloaded from eventideaudio.com, would you believe? Uh, you do have to register your device, if I remember right, so that you can download it. And that's what we will be going and doing uh, a little bit later. This power supply is absolutely, really, really very cheap. And my guess is that this power supply to Eventide costs five dollars or less well i know it does i'm pretty confident about that because i buy these all the time it can pull off at the front here it's got a little clip so you can unclip it but this this clip and what it holds in here it's really really not very good i don't know who's told them it's a good power supply for something that costs a thousand quid these people must be uh well Oh, they're not based in California, are they? <laughs> See, this is a power supply. That's a decent power supply. This is a Roland one. Unfortunately, it's the wrong end connector. But what we need, this one is a negative center, which is a real pity because other than that, this would be a really, really good power supply. Now, I'm sure that Roland probably make one that could uh, do this, or you'll have to have a look at the third party ones, but just trust me on this. This is a one amp, I think it's nine or 12 volts, 12 volts, one amp, really, really cheap, degrading piece of equipment for something as good as that. Now I must say, apart from the uh, awful power supply, I do like the unit. It's a big improvement over the, uh, H9 with a lack of control ability easily and memorable you still have to remember an awful lot on this device to use all these controls I'm sure you are, I'll get used to them and you'll get used to them as you spend time with the unit but you know ease of use is always something that matters and what you really do when you make things harder you actually reduce your own ability to sell your product. Because once, once the word gets out and, oh, I can't control that, well, users don't buy them. Eventide is a great brand. It's a great product too. And I've used them for years, like I said. Strangely enough, I had a, an Eventide Eclipse. And that was difficult to use on the menus as well. And so is the... Uh, H7600 I've got in the other room there. So it's keeping up the uh, <laughs> it's keeping up the tradition of making it a little bit harder than you want it to be. But don't, don't hold that against it because I mean you're buying this really for the tones. Let's take a look at the chips before we move on and then we'll move on to the software which will bring this unit into a different light than how you currently see it so far in this review I think that will change things but a lot of people also want to know about the processing power and that sort of thing in a device that costs a thousand pounds a lot of people want to know that oh you don't well just go down in the text and you can find we've got chapters so you can move along to the exciting bits that you want to see hopefully one of your exciting bits won't be this power supply <laughs> Okay, well, as you can see down there, I've got the unit connected now. I had to do a firmware update and all that sort of thing. You might see a few pictures float by on the screen as I harp on about that. <laughs> but uh, I had a bit of trouble getting logged into my account, which you have to have, and you have to have the device registered, by the way, on eventideaudio.com. Uh, or you now can get the software and you're not going to be able to do anything else. Another thing that was a little bit funny was the manual, which uh, initially uh, only provided itself in a HTML format, which I particularly dislike myself. I don't want to be on a little crappy phone uh, trying to download and understand a complex device. 
However, later it did give me a PDF, which I've downloaded, and I'm going to print into this, because I like print, don't you? <laughs> oh, you don't? Best of luck. Let's move on to the, uh, the section where we just discuss quickly the specificate or some of the specification and the, the, the few chips that I just want to mention uh, without going into hyper depth and that sort of thing, you know. Well, strangely enough, it all sounds so familiar, this does. <laughs> Every time I go looking at these processors these days, I'm finding roughly the same sort of, uh, same sort of devices. And in this case, it's not really that much of an exception. This one here is a, a Giga device, S Semiconductor Incorporated product. And it's a GD32F. I've got to read it because I can't remember all this stuff. <laughs> it's a GD32F103XX, ARM Cortex, isn't that familiar? M3, 32-bit microcontroller unit. And I actually have some of the data sheets without getting bogged down too much. But this one, it says here, the GD32F103XX device is a 32-bit general-purpose microcontroller based on the ARM Cortex M3 RISC core with the best ratio in terms of processing power, reduced power consumption, and peripheral set. So there. The Cortex-M3 is a next-generation processor uh, core, which is tightly coupled with a nested vectored interrupt controller, or NVIC. I've never heard of that one. A SysTick timer and advanced debug support. It's moving on to newer stuff, isn't it? The GD32F103XX device incorporates the ARM Cortex M3 32-bit uh, processor core operating at 108 megahertz frequency. That's worth knowing. With flash accesses, zero weight states to obtain maximum efficiency. It provides up to 3 meg on-chip flash memory and up to 96 kilobit SRAM memory. An extensive range of enhanced IOs and peripherals connected with two APB buses. The devices offer up to three 12-bit ADCs, up to two 12-bit DACs, up to 10 general 16-bit timers, two basic timers plus two PWM advanced timers, as well as standard and advanced communication interfaces. The device operates from a 2.6 to 3.6 volt power supply and available in minus 40 to plus 85 degrees C. Minus 40, that's about what it's like in England right now, but not as bad as America and Canada, I hear. Several power saving modes provide the flexibility for maximum optimization between wake-up latency and power consumption, and especially important consideration in low-power applications, which I suppose this is. The above features make the GD32F103 devices suitable for a wide range of applications. I'm sure they do, especially in areas such as industrial controls, uh, motor drives, power monitor and alarm systems, consumer and handheld equipment, POS, vehicle GPS, believe it or not, video intercom, PC peripherals, and so on. Yeah, it's very extensive and it's probably found in so many different devices. I don't have a price for it, but I suspect it won't be tens and tens of or well, hundreds of dollars. Well, that covers the uh, basic processing power, but we've also got uh, A to D and D to A converters, uh, which I've got a piece of paper on. And I'm only going to read it to you, but you won't read this anywhere else, I doubt. Yeah, this is a PCM 3168A. It's a 24-bit, 96 kilohertz slash 192 kilohertz, six in and eight out audio codec with a differential input output. Yeah, there's a huge amount of stuff I could cover here. I'm not going to harp on about it for long, except to say what its features are. And here they are, 24-bit ADC and DAC, 6-channel ADC, high-performance, differential, and single-ended. FS equals 48 kilohertz. The THD plus N is minus 93 dB, which is differential and single-ended. Signal-to-noise is 107 dB, but for single-ending, it's 104 dB. Dynamic range is 107 dB for differential and 104 dB for single-ended. 
Sampling rate is 8 kilohertz to 96 kilohertz. Worth knowing. System clock, well, there's a 256, a 384, 5 watt, 12, a 768. Differential voltage input is 2 v volts RMS. Single ended voltage input is 1 volt RMS. There's an 8 channel DAC. High performance, again 48 kilohertz. What are the spec sounds pretty similar to me. What else have we got? Applications for this one, car audio, external amplifiers, car audio, AVN applications, home theatres, AV receivers, and so on. This device is a high performance, single chip, 24 bit, 6 in, 8 out audio coder and decoder. Codex, that's what they call them. With single ended and differential selectable analog inputs and differential outputs. Yeah, there it is. Actually came from uh, originally September 2008 from what it says here, revised in 2016. And it's a Texas Instruments device. And that's nearly it for the chips. I mean, I found lots of these little things like the CMOS quad bilateral switch, the CM066B I think it was. Not that it matters to me and you I don't think. I think the ones that really mattered are the things like the processor. And the uh, the DAC stuff, yeah. Yeah, the codec stuff. And apart from that, well, the build quality matters. We got a good look in there. So I'm going to really, rather than harp on about all this, I'm going to leave it at that and say that, well, all that's uh, pretty okay. It's reasonable. It's what I expect to see. Anyway, let's move on a bit further. Well, where are we so far? Well, so far, we've taken a look inside the unit. It's all pretty hunky-dory in there. We've discussed the chips, just, and we showed you some earlier on. We've taken a look at the external I.O. and some of the, the knobs on the top, which can get extensively difficult if you try and remember them. <laughs> I did. No. Even with the quick reference guide, I'm sure you'll be going around on them knobs on the top. For a few hours, but once you get down to something like this that's going to be coming up presently, that'll change things. So how is everything so far? Well, it's reasonable, but you've got to remember it's a very expensive piece of gear for what it is. It's, the other pedal was, well, in its cheapest time, I think was about 400 quid. And then they put the algorithms in and she took it up to 700 pounds, which I thought was a bit expensive, really. Well, it's like this one, I think. This one's a bit expensive. Let me give you a reason why. I know, I know. You're going to tell me, Tony, you're off your head, but I'm not quite off my head. Nearly. <laughs> Anybody remember this one? The Ocean Machine. Yeah. Mr Townsend. No, not that Mr Townsend. Devin Townsend made this with Moore, or more, call it what you like, and it does a whole pile of stuff. I just thought I wanted to show you that. Now I know it's not the same, but the thing is it's about a quarter of the price. And you can get a lot of these sort of uh, styles of tones that are in this out of that if you play around a little bit. My God, you're going to be playing around a bit with this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good so far. Bear that other item in mind, just before you jump in and spend your thousand pounds on this one. And do remember that it's my opinion that you will be printing out a manual. My manuals for my H7600 are in the other room, all three of them I think there is. It takes forever to work your way through it all the time. You'll never remember everything. Some people will tell me they can. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the software and run through the software and show you how easy it is to do uh, the control of this thing with the software and all that sort of stuff, which changes the device, in my opinion. It's a bit like the, uh, the H9. The software changed the operation of the unit because without the software, I have to say this, without that software there, I wouldn't have bought it. Too much aggro, too much trying to remember everything and all the rest. With the software, 
rock and roll. And by the way, you're not going to be able to get the software, just in case I didn't mention it, unless you've registered the device and you've logged in and you've done all that. And when you're running this software, you have to be logged into your account. It's just one thing. Yeah, one thing after another sometimes. <laughs> anyway, let's move on and let's move to uh, take a good look at that software. Okay, well, here we are in front of the software. And uh, here's my H90. I can connect to the device down here just by hitting that. But do understand that you have to be online, which I've mentioned earlier. And here we are in the unit. And I have to be honest, there's quite a lot of things that you can do to this. You've got presets for all sorts of things. We've got a menu up here, a burger control. We've got preferences. Blah, 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 blah. We've got programs. We've got system settings. There is a lot to look at. And that's something that you need to take into consideration because, honestly, it's not a two-minute thing. Now, I'm going to talk a little few seconds about the little manual that it comes with, which is this one here, the Quick Reference Guide. And only after you've logged on and registered the device in your name can you get a PDF, which I've mentioned before, that you could then turn into a manual. Well, the problem is, maybe or not, that manual is uh, near enough 200 pages long. In fact, here's the one I did earlier. And you can see quite easily that it's full from start to finish. It is a complex, complex manual for the H90. And I found over the years uh, with using Eventide that the manuals are always complex. I think on the uh, H7600, I think I've got three manuals for that, which is a bit crazy. It gets a bit to be... Uh, well, a bit more than crazy, if you think about it. Anyway, what we're going to do is uh, have a look at these parameters in some sort of order. And, uh, you know, you'll get some idea. Clearly, there's far too much for me to demonstrate, to even try and demonstrate, uh, with the, the H90. It's, it's a product that isn't really that simple, unless you use the defaults and you this and you that. There's no point in just using defaults. You might want to spend some time getting all this stuff exactly as you want it. Now then, Eventide, providing you've got the manual, don't, uh, don't let you struggle too much. <laughs> well, actually they do, but that's another story. You can see in here that there's even a tuner. Yeah. You've got to look in the manual to find it, of course, else you're getting round in circles. But also, importantly, in the setup section, you can see that there are many different setups. One stereo insert setup. We've got all the, the sort of usual things. Wet and dry amplifier. There are all the usual things that you might want to uh, have a mess around with. You know how it goes. I won't show you all of these. Uh, guitar and vocals with mic and this one's here pre and post amplifier. We go a bit further. This is the one I want you to cover. This is a, a dual inserts with a door or mixing console and uh, that's useful. It tells you how to do that. Go and do this, press this, do that. In fact, it's a good example because there's the picture and here's all the instructions to get it set up like that. Which is, uh, it says a lot really. Uh, you can remember how to do all that without the manual. I don't think so. Okay, well, what I want to do is to uh, run through some of the simple things in this. And we'll start off, really, with the uh, the sort of system menu, which is uh, really, really uh, an important area, particularly to getting it set up in the first place. We can see here we've got the input-output section where we can just flip between line or instrument. It's really that simple. Uh, these are the inputs, the pedal, the expression pedal. And we've got uh, the output side as well. Output, 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 input, input, input. 
which we showed you earlier on these things. If you look at these, these are showing you <laughs> literally where number one is and number two is, where input four is, uh, sorry, down there, and so on and so forth. It's a bit of idiot proof, really. We've got tempo, which we can change. I'm not going to do anything with it. It defaults to 120 BPM, which is fair enough for me. We've got MIDI, uh, it's on channel 1, we can whip around here and uh, make it whatever channel we want. We can receive Omni on or off. And all the usual things that you might do in MIDI. We've got these other global preferences too. Uh, the LED brightness on the unit. It sounds crazy, but uh, you can change that to being low. And if you... Look at this over here. Well, they flash funny on the low. Let's put it back to high. There you go. So it's got a screen saver as well, so that we don't burn in this screen over here. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. And and the uh, the source type, uh, we've got a number of choices: guitar, bass, lead, or sub. It says there. Well, you choose what you do, don't you? We got a. 10 seconds spillover for the audio from one thing to the next, which I think uh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, we've got uh, digital single processing or, processing or relay. I don't know what that does. I'll have to have a look at it. And we've got kill dry off or kill dry on. Yeah, so there's quite a few things you can do in here. Oh, we've got another section other than the settings for external control. I'm not going to do much with it, but I'll show you. Yeah, load the current queued program, blah, 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 blah. It's just loads and loads and loads of things to do that you can set them up down here for MIDI transmit and all sorts of different stuff. It, uh, it can get crazy, it can, because there's little that you can't do. And uh, that's one of the things about buying one of these devices, I guess. If you're somebody who's really technical and really wants to get to the nth degree, well, this is probably the device for you. But if you're an ordinary guy who just wants to get some great tones or sounds or uh, effects, well, maybe not quite. I don't know. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay, well, we've got a mass of stuff on this main screen here, this edit screen, which is choosable from there. We've also got program screen and we can go and choose any of these and we've got the system screen that we've already looked at let's go back to this one now you'll notice in here that you've got loads of sort of things going on if you think of it as a left side and a right side because i've always felt that this device is really it's two devices in one that's how i see it at least so we can look at the effects on the clean ambient Digital delay, ambient delay, this side. Item A, see that? And we can whip over to this side where we can see the effects and we can look at item B or uh, what should I call it? Item B, ba basically. Yeah, so that one's a reverb empty auditorium and this one's a digital delay. How odd does it have to be? They're the parameters. If we whip across, We've got some more general parameters, gain, in, gain, out, gain, bypass, tails, tempo, usual stuff. And highly likely we've got the same with this side. Yes, we have. So if you think of it, like I said, of two effects in one, it's a good thing. And this down the bottom really is going to be how these two react to each other or the mix together. There's a mix. The in, gain, the out, gain. Again, the hot knob is set to 100%, wherever that might be. I've yet to find that one. <laughs> Global and tails and all the rest of it. So, yeah, quite interesting, uh, even on just one screen like that. And we haven't gone anywhere yet. Okay, here we go. Uh, what I want to do is just to show you this section up here. It's simple enough. A user one is for all the presets that are already in the damn thing. You can see them down here. There's quite a lot of them. All these different banks. 
we see they go on forever. And they've got these funny uh, characters or uh, what should I call them, effect type icons down the side here of roughly what they do. Once again, it's okay, but you've got to really uh, spend a bit of time learning them. There is uh, 10 of them, believe it or not. So there's user one, and if we whip down, you'll see that everything's changed. All this has changed. Move to another one, bank three. Again, you're gonna see more or less depending on what's in each uh, section as this is expanded and that hasn't, if you can see that. Looking under general, we're back to the same sort of thing. So where the effect is, is where you're going to see the most things to change. But if I go back to uh, Clean Ambient, and then whip up here to User 2, which you can set up, no problem. You can see that User 2 is all initialized, so you can make your own here. And I'm going down here to 99 okay so we go back to user 3 we've got another oh oh did you see that crash your armor oh, i'm glad that's on camera <laughs> see that so anything you just did you lost nice <laughs> how bad was that oh user three's there now well that's all a bit crazy, and uh, I'm glad it's been on camera. Well, let's see if we can get to user 4. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I'll either crash or it won't. Well, it looks like it didn't. So there you have it. Loads of minutes. There's 99 for each one of them users, uh, which is uh, going to keep you busy a long time. Okay, so you get the idea. Choose something. Celestial Chimes. That sounds good, doesn't it? You can see there's a lot of stuff to work on. I'm not going to go through everything because it really would be crazy to try and do that. If I can click this. You can see Prism Shift documentation, which is good. Because you're never remembering everything. I, I'll tell you now, you, you really won't. You can export and import it. You can import H9, H9 uh, presets as well, if you can see that. Yeah, or you can save this when you've done it to a library. And that can be the same on this side. You've got mode, echo verb documentation, copy, export, import, import H9 tide. That was what the original was. Import H9 dot H9 Z preset. And you can save to library again. So it's all pretty much of a much. Obviously, you've got to spend time on these algorithms. You've got to spend time on it. And the best way, in my opinion, is plug your guitar in and, uh, yeah, play around with it. You could be playing around a long time. And that's one of the things I've always found with any device that starts getting really complex. In fact, the H7600 I had a fair number of years ago and the uh, Eventide Eclipse was also quite hard work uh, in its day. The H9 in its day without the software was difficult. You can imagine all of this stuff, you know, on that little piece of hardware over there without this software. Uh, I'm telling you now, it would not be fun. Okay, well, what we're going to look at uh, now, now we've seen this sort of section here with these banks, we're going to have a quick look at the program. Well, the program section you can see it here and it goes on and on and on and on there are loads and loads and loads of stuff in here and will you ever really use them all well no i'm pretty sure you won't but like the h7600 they are in there and if ever you do need them well it's all good you can see these here. Let's just choose one. Ambient fields. Mod delay. Ultra tap. It's in user one. So you could find it in there. Probably. We look at that. You can see the routing of the thing. And that sort of stuff. So we look at another ambient fields. Oh, let's have a look at Andromeda. What's that doing? 
There it is. It pulls it up onto the uh, device, by the way. And there are a lot of algorithms. You can see them there. Now, the reason I mention algorithms is probably about 40% uh, or 35% of the manual purely relating to things like algorithms. Some have funny names, some don't. Yeah, crystals, I remember. Yeah. And this is... This section now changed to everything's got crystals in it, if you get me. So we're looking for a program that's got crystals. There's one there. And that's thrown it across to the unit so we can have a bit of a play around and all that sort of stuff. Well, just while we're still in the, uh, the sort of programs area, uh, you know, I want to show you this little bit here. It says here, hide duplicates. Now you can see with that unticked, you can see all these all the way down here. There really is buckets of them. I haven't sat there counting them and I don't intend to. But if we hide the duplicates, we've now got a list of non-duplicates. And you can see that it's it's so extensive. All very nice. And we can still use this sort of selector. If I want to have a look at crystals again. These are crystals. Without them, Or with them take your pick and we can clear them all and start again so if I go to crystals I get just crystals and I've got high duplicates you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about now a little bit more on all of this uh, one of the things I can't find easily at least <laughs> is a manual for this uh, control this control center so I'm sort of thumbing around a little bit uh, a little bit in the dark on some of it. You've got to go through such a big manual. I keep talking about this, but this is the way it is. You know, this, for example, you've got this sort of section down here. This makes it, from what I see, uh, if we look at what's going on up there, if I hit HS1, we've now got fewer parameters that we can change or mess around with them than this HS2, which chooses some different ones. And HS3, chooses some different ones you can also bypass them too so if I choose HS1 and say bypass it's all bypassed that's bypassed the actual uh, preset and down at the bottom here we've also got this stuff I want to just cover quickly really all these parameters is here but then we've got the routing and inserts and there's a lot of it again you've got to read the manual for this uh, with these dual inserts and stuff like that. It can get a little bit uh, hard work, yeah. But you can save what you've done, do remember that there. Let's have a look at the uh, control assignments. Well, <laughs> the quick knobs, performance switches, everything you can change around uh, for whatever you want, really. You can see it. It's quite... Extensive. It's almost as extensive as the 7600 with all the things that you can do. Uh, yeah, it drives you mad. <laughs> However, for, for, for professional guys who do nothing else, it's probably a good device. For the everyday guy, well, maybe it's a little bit harder. We've got some other things down the bottom here, which, well, rename the current list. That's probably import, that's probably export, which it is. Let's delete the list, and that there is save the selected item. Why well, aren't going to change anything? <laughs> but there you are. I hope you get some idea of uh, some of the things you can do with it. As I said, it is extensive. It's very long. I'm long-winded, and that's that. Well, there you go. I hope that uh, little episode of uh, looking at the uh, control software will help you a bit. It does open up the, uh, the hardware quite dramatically, in my opinion. Of course, my opinion isn't everybody's opinion. It's my opinion. And I tend to be rather like an ordinary sort of guy that went out, bought the thing, and had a go, or is having a go type of thing. And the things I find, as always, are... It's a great device, this is. Uh, yeah, you can do a lot with it. 
But I tell you what, it's a lot of learning to do. When I was talking of that manual, and I've talked about it off and on and off and on, trust me, there are 200 pages, and I don't care how good you are, you won't remember all that. Some people might tell you they can. <laughs> well, hey, listen, I'm not actually an idiot. <laughs> When you're buying one of these, be prepared to put the hours behind it. It reminds me of the 7600 and of the Eclipse and the H9 wasn't quite as bad. This is like twice as bad. <laughs> Actually, it's a great device. You can get sounds out of this and tone, well, they're not tones as such, they're more sounds out of this that, that you'll never get really any easy way out or anything else. Contrary to what I said earlier. <laughs> the algorithms in here, you know, honestly, it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's some quite funny names as well. Got one here called Harmadillo. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything to that. Whoever came up with the names, all I can tell you, it's got a sense of humour. But I, I want to move on to warranty now, because uh, I think that's also important. Now, the thing is with Eventide, they only give you a one-year warranty. Now, that in itself isn't bad. It's a one-year warranty. But at the sort of money that this is, I would have thought you might have got a little bit better warranty than one year, with a load of restrictions at the back in the manual, telling you what is and what isn't and that sort of thing, you know. It's applicable to a lot of companies, many companies that I look at the gear and uh, yeah, there it is one year. I've even seen some where they try and have less. <laughs> so a one year warranty it is, uh, whether you think that's good, bad or indifferent for a product that's a thousand pounds or twelve hundred dollars in England. Uh, put down in the comments. Yeah. Tell me what you think about a warranty of that length. Does it matter? Doesn't it matter? They do say in the manual, by the way, even if you just take the back off, your warranty's void. So my warranty's void, and I've got one thing to say to you, but I might get in trouble for doing it. Do I even care? I couldn't care less, matey. We'll talk a bit about price. I mean, I've talked about price off and on. I think I've mentioned it earlier, but it's about a thousand pounds. Yeah, it's not cheap for what it is. Uh, I don't think it is anyway. Some people might say, oh, it's so cheap. I'll buy it out of the tea money. But a lot of guys that are guitarists, and it's aimed at guitarists, uh, you know, the electric guitarist, the acoustic guitarist, and even the bass player can all get in on the act, so to speak. So for each thousand quid, yeah, I suppose it's not bad. It's not bad. It's never discounted from what I've seen and in fact some companies these quote authorised dealers are pushing the retail higher yeah or let me rephrase that they're selling it at a higher price than what I believe is retail now some of them don't do that but some of them certainly do as soon as there's a new product out and this one is no exception make no mistake of that as soon as there's a new product out up goes the price above retail and then later, it will come down. Well, that says a lot about the company you're buying from. Have a think about that one, won't you? Okay, I'm going to do a bit of summing up now. Somebody's got to, haven't they? You'd like me to just say it's brilliant and there's no things wrong with it and everything's hunky-dory. It's not really the case. Having said that, of all the devices that are out there that I know of, that I've actually used. I don't think you can buy something that really can offer you more than what this does if you are prepared to put the effort in. That's so important to understand. I can't even make this video as I want to make it because I don't know enough about the unit. <laughs> and that's simply because I've had it a day or so. It's hard to take in in one hit. 
my guess is you'd be on it a couple of weeks to maybe even a month or two, depending on how good you are. So that's a consideration uh, to, uh, to think about. I like the hardware itself in general, not the power supply. I like all the hardware. So uh, I'm ha very happy with the hardware. But I was always happy with, in general, the uh, Eventide hardware. You know, Eventide come from making other things as well. I think they make uh, sort of uh, equipment for boats and planes and all sorts of things, type of thing. So they come from a, a what I would call a high-end sector into what's really a more low-end sector. And I think uh, that's reflected in the price and the way that that manual over there, just down there, has been written and put together. It's great. It would be really good if you were using it in a boat to go somewhere. <laughs> but you know what they ought to do, don't you? They ought to have the simple edition and the complex edition. And by the way, I never saw, I never saw a manual for the actual uh, software. No, there was nothing that I could find. It could be around. But ask yourself this, if uh, Tony's been looking around and he can't find it, uh, yeah, why? If it is there, why? If it isn't there, why? <laughs> Think of that. The algorithms are extensive. You're going to hear it presently. It's going to be coming up. I've just got to do the little bit of summing up. The algorithms are extensive, as I said. Uh, yeah, the sounds or tones. Oh, I don't know what I call them, really. I would say sounds. Uh, yeah, they're, they're impeccable. And you can go on and edit any one of them, even, for hours. <laughs> I'd always recommend that you have your guitar plugged into this so you can hear what you're messing around with, whether you're in the control or whether you're just faffing around on the front. I'd always recommend that. And, uh, yeah, walk, don't run. Have a play with the presets first. It's good advice, just trust me. So, Tony, what about a score? What score would you give it? I mean, this is a premium product, isn't it? Everybody tells me, I go and look at the reviews, which I don't look at much, by the way. I go and look at them, and everybody's saying, oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's not quite as awesome as some people might say. I do think that the... It reminds me a lot of the uh, Axe FX3 when it came out. That was very complex, or could be very complex. And this is about the same. It can be very complex if you want it to be. That's all well and good, but that reduces the marketplace for the people that would buy this. If this was a simpler to use device, they'd probably sell more. Maybe they're happy selling less. I doubt it. So things about complexity and those sorts of things, very important. A big fat 190 plus page manual, important. Software man manual, important, but it isn't there. The power supply is a total, complete, in my opinion, joke. Uh, I think you ought to spend $6 rather than 5 If you want my opinion, Mr. Eventide, I think it's disgusting. <laughs> really. Uh, and the rest of it, well, yeah, I like the rest. So, the score I'm going to give it is 7 yeah, that's all it gets because of all the other things, all the other baggage or garbage that goes with it. There's lots of it. And when all these guys come on and tell you, oh, it's the best thing in the world. No, no, it's not as simple as that. If it was as simple as that, well, I'd have just played half a dozen uh, tones and said, thanks, it's great. But I didn't, did I? Hey, you. Anybody home? Why don't you subscribe? Do that thumbs up thing and notify, you know, tick all. And then you'll get the sort of one a week typical video that I make. I don't always even make one a week. So you don't get many notifications from me. Not like some of those people out there. Uh, yeah, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of reviews that... Could be like this one, somewhere better than this one by a long way. This one is difficult because it's difficult. That's simple. I've tried at least, haven't I? And I haven't just 
played things. <laughs> yeah, don't forget. Yeah, you need to help the channel a bit if you can. And all you need to do is subscribe, do that thumbs up and tick all. Now, if you want to learn more about uh, Eventide or this product, go to eventideaudio.com and have a look at what they've got. But be prepared to get your money out. That's what I generally say uh, with Eventide. What you do pay for, I guess, for what you get. And that's always a, a good thing. And don't forget to also visit www.tonymackenzie.com, which is a, a website I've had for many, many years. It's got a load of reviews on it that aren't on YouTube. Some are, but most aren't. Well, you might have a piece of gear that you currently own that uh, you didn't quite know enough about or want to know some more about. It could be on my uh, website. So that's worth going and taking a look. Okay, well, all I've got left is coming up is the audio. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into the uh, control room. I'm going to play some of these algorithms as they are. I'm not going to sit here messing around for hours on that. There's far too many to, to even think of doing that. I've run out of time with this one. I've got more to do while I'm on the holidays. And uh, I'm afraid that's the limit of where I stop. I don't know how long this video is, but it's well over an hour. Hmm. By the time I get to the end, at least. So, yeah, you're going to get some clean, well, I say clean, some uh, untouched algorithms, and then maybe I'll use some in a track or something like that, you know, in a musical content. So uh, I think that's the best way with this one, rather than just playing the odd bit with backing tracks and things. Y you want to hear some of these, yeah. And I'll create them as best I can. Until next time, listen, it's been great seeing you. Well, nearly seeing you. you you've seen me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, go and have a listen at the tones and the rest of it. And I hope it helps you, this video, to determine whether that is for you or it isn't. Now get out of here. Boom! Okay, well, what's the plan today? Well, the plan is, I have the... Uh, H90 in the other room, over there, going through a, what is it going through? It's going through a Jackson Amp Works, which is basically like a, a copy of a, a Plexi. But it's got these other modes, so if I get into the heavier stuff, that amp in there will just certainly do it. It's coming through uh, a microphone, uh, an AKG microphone, through the uh, computer network, and into the desk to get recorded in Studio One. They're going to be mono initially, and maybe if I uh, pull a couple of wires out of that later on, we'll just bang something in and see what that does. But I don't want to spend forever sitting here when every other review out there actually uh, actually shows you anyway. Uh, I'll show you what I get just by plugging in, choosing a few settings, and away you go. So let's get on with it. The first one is uh, 05 12 stringy, <laughs> which sounds a bit weird, but that's its name. <laughs> Okay, well the next one coming up is uh, 07 Auto War, and I just thought I'd just play that just so you can see whether it tracks or it doesn't and stuff like that. Okay, well the next one coming up is uh, called 09 Paradise Queen and it's just a very nice clean tone, that's all you can say about it really. 
It's got its place, definitely. <laughs> Okay, well this next one's called uh, number 10, Green Tides. Make of it what you will, but it, uh, it's still on that clean channel. I haven't changed the amp at all. So anything you hear is being affected by the uh, H90. Now the next one's called uh, 13 Cinema Trick. It's an interesting uh, uh, setting if you will because you can do a lot with it but it does drone on a lot so it's got its place but not necessarily where you might think. Anyway just have a listen at this I'm just going to play a few notes <laughs> just, <laughs> just to get it across to you and uh, we'll see what comes out right. <laughs> Well, the next one up's called uh, number 21, Instant Flavour. And it is what it is. It harps on about different things. I don't really understand some of them. They're all so so. You've got to be a bit careful with them, but uh, take your pick. Here it is. <laughs> Okay, well this next one seems to me, uh, seems to come across like uh, like a riff type of thing, you know. And uh, by the way, you'll hear the tones have changed. Uh, the only thing I've changed is treble to, to bass pickup and things like that. But apart from that, the amp remains clean. So anything you do here is coming through that box. <laughs> Okay, well, a bit of a change of guitar. This is the, uh, the Strata sort of built, uh, or made, or assembled, or call it what you will, back in about 2009 or 10. And uh, it's got those uh, David White pickups in that we're going to see in another review coming up uh, of the building of a Telecaster, where I managed to get a set of these David White pickups, but Telecaster ones. And uh, yeah, well, very interesting that is. Uh, they have a particular tone. It's not coming out the best in this particular uh, test, if you will. But don't worry about that. You'll get to hear them in the Telecaster, which will be toppy, of course. Anyway, on to this one. This one is 42 Tight Drive. 
Yeah, that's what it says. The amp hasn't been changed from being still on a clean channel, by the way, so just take that into account, won't you? Yeah, of course you will. Honestly, I could sit here all day, <laughs> not. The thing about the Eventide H90 is very much like the H9, in my opinion. You've got more control, you've got, in effect, a sort of second uh, pedal, if you will. Got all that sort of stuff. But I could carry on running through these things, these presets, all day. And it comes across to me, as they always tend to, uh, in that sort of format. Uh, like a very ambient type of piece of gear. Not unlike the Moore or more uh, Devin Townsend pedal that I talked about all that time ago. Um, you could achieve a lot of those tones on that pedal. So would you spend a thousand pounds on this one? You go and consider that. Uh, consider it yourself. I'm just going to set that up just so I've got a nice reverb and a bit of delay. And you know what? I don't need anything else. I never really have. That's how I play. Oh, you're different. Well, that's great. That pedal might be for you. But do bear in mind that uh, it is what it is. Go on through these, these presets forever. There's no real point in doing that. I just wanted to give you a flavour of some of them that are sitting there. And all I'm going to do now is load up a backing track and play through a backing track. And thanks. <laughs> so... That's it for now. I'll probably change guitars yet again, because I'm like that. And uh, yeah, let's see how it all comes out in a, a track with audio, you know, with backing tracks on it. And uh, go from there. But don't expect anything dynamic out of the Eventide H90 from me, because it isn't a pedal that I would normally buy. I bought it to review, remember that. <laughs>